Welcome back. It's week 15 from the Stands College Football Show. Guys, I can't believe we have made it to the end of the regular season. A uh, bit surprising we've made it this far, but here we are. Uh, we have a great slate of games for you, and joining me this week to talk about them, we have Andy and Tom again. Andy, of course, our Illini fan, and Tom, our Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan. Andy, Tom, how's it going, guys? It's going good, going good. Good Friday afternoon. Thank you very much for having me, Brian and Andy. Looking forward to talking to both of you today. Uh, I'm doing well, gentlemen. Look at us. Three weeks in a row, we got the show out uh, together, the same, the same group. Uh, but I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm glad to be here. You know, uh, my line, I didn't get it done last week against a ranked Iowa team. You know, they played one and a half quarters of good football and then kind of forgot what they were doing, blow the 14-point lead and uh, give up 35 unanswered. Um, but, you know, we're here. Another week. Didn't expect us to win anyways, but it, when you when you start a game up uh, 14 to zero through a quarter and a half and you look unstoppable, it, it is kind of heartbreaking when you, you lose like that. But we're on to this week. We're on to more important things, more relevant teams <laughs> in college football that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, today. Yes, uh, well, everyone's relevant. We'll, we'll give the, the Illini a little bit of respect. Uh, but yeah, let's get into right, some other games up. from the week, our weekly recap. Uh, Who did you guys see la this past week uh, that impressed you? Interesting games. Uh, we'll start with Andy on this one. Yeah, so I'm going to continue my trend in, during this segment of going with uh, a highlight, you know, player's performance. I know the first few weeks I've highlighted some running backs uh, from the MAC. Um, this week, I mean, performance of the week, I think you have to go with Devonta Smith from Alabama. I mean, the, the Tide absolutely crush LSU 55-17. He finishes the game with eight catches for 231 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, oh, by the way, he had seven of those for 219 yards and all three of those touchdowns at halftime. Uh, you talk about a 65-yard score, a 61-yard score. I think each of those were to cap off like three play drives. The Tide were getting whatever they wanted. And then maybe his most impressive catch of the night was that 20-yard score uh, where he mossed Derek Stingley Jr., arguably LSU's best uh, cornerback, that circus catch in the end zone for a 20-yard TD. But shout-out to Devonta Smith. I mean, he absolutely – uh, crushed it. I mean, and then BYU Coastal, but I'm going to get into that uh, uh, in a little bit in our next segment. Yeah, definitely a lot to unpack in that game. Uh, Tom, who are your game or games of the week that uh, you liked? Well, I'm not going to steal Andy's thunder, guys, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I do think the TCU win was impressive over Oklahoma State, the, a team that needed a win. But my game of the week, and I'm only saying this because i believe I picked them on last week's show. I, I rode that coastal wave and they beat BYU 22 to 17. The coastal defense held Zach Wilson to just one touchdown. This is probably uh, probably his worst performance of the season. Thanks to that coastal defense. Uh, it was a awkward ending. If you watched it live, there was a, you know, yeah. a little scuffle, but uh, CJ Marable running back had two touchdowns and coastal up to number 11 in the rankings. So, real good win for this program and yeah i'm just uh, i'm i'm happy i, I kind of hit a home run on that game so that's definitely my game of the week but look tcu was very impressive too guys down year trying to you know remain bowl eligible and they're back above 500 so kudos to both those teams tom what did the horn frogs do in that game uh rush for over 227 yards they're now five and oh when they've rushed yeah. for over 227 yards well, like you know i had on last week's show I swung and missed with the Cowboys, so you know. I did. We, I think we all did. They're not a good road team. They, they can't win on the road. And they lost to Oklahoma. Look what happened then. They were ranked higher, and they lost to them. So, yeah. I, for me, obviously, I'll also hold off on the BYU Coastal. Uh, definitely a lot more coming up on them later. Uh, two that definitely interested me, like you said, the Alabama versus LSU game. I don't think anything was too surprising, but. Uh, 17 points for LSU, kind of good. Uh, I wasn't expecting them to get that many, honestly. They went over their team total. They went over the team total, I believe. So. Exactly. I mean, a little impressive, I guess. Uh, still a blowout. But, uh, yeah, the thing that caught my eye about that game, just watching it, uh, the absolutely explosive offense, yet again, of Alabama, it made me realize that there are 
I will confirm three very legitimate Heisman candidates on that team. Uh, Mac Jones, obviously the one that gets the most press. Najee Harris, probably sitting in there at second. But Devonta Smith, wide receivers don't get much love in the Heisman race. That kid is an absolute freak of nature. I mean, any you could pick any of his touchdowns from that game and just, you know, it's a wow moment, a Heisman moment. Uh, he had several in the first half. Probably could have had more, but Alabama turned it down uh, after the half because they were up 45-17. to 17. No need to really score any more points there. And then Florida, Tennessee, just got to call out my own idiocy here. I said I would sell that game up to around 21, 24 points. It was looking very good. Florida up 31-7 until the last five minutes. Two garbage time touchdowns. But it took down the regular uh, Florida betters as well. So if I'm crashing and burning, I'm glad everyone got taken down with me there in that one. Yeah, I was uh, one of those regular Florida betters. Missed really? on uh I had them minus 17, and actually my buddy's girlfriend, my buddy's a huge Florida fan, and him and his girlfriend are watching the game, and he's like, I, okay, I just need them to win by 18. And <laughs> it was the third quarter, and they're winning by 24. And his girlfriend, she goes, well, they're, they're winning by 18 right now. They've, they've got it. And so that was the jinx. So you uh, can blame it all on her, that, that, or at least that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, not, one more game I kind of forgot about. Wisconsin-Indiana ranked matchup. Wisconsin looked really bad. Indiana's defense stepped up big. And then you talk about Tuttle comes in for Penix Jr. and, and gets them the win. I know it's 14-6 to six is the final score, but it's just a classic Big Ten game. And another ranked matchup, which should probably mention. And then Iowa State, 42-6 to six over West Virginia, just got whatever they want. Uh, Brees Hall, who we've mentioned on this show before, had an absolute day. Brock Purdy's turning into a legit NFL quarterback, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, the Cyclones are one to watch out for. It's just a shame that they have those two losses, uh, because if they didn't, I think they're right there in playoff consideration. Yeah. But I mean, before we move on, I'll, also, I'll kind of want to touch on that. The big 12 as a whole, I feel like the entire, you know, upper echelon of that conference is here. One less loss mm -hmm. and they're in the conversation, but you got Oklahoma state, Oklahoma and I, uh, Iowa state all sitting there with that second loss and, you know, just kind of cancellation by, uh, by default, just kind of knocked. The yeah, they ate. They kind of they kind of ate themselves alive. You know, they just a bunch of them beating up, beating up on each other in uh, conference play. Right. Moving on, uh, we will get into our games of the year. There's been some absolute beauties this year, uh, but definitely some some special ones out there. Tom, who do you have for your 2020 game of the year? Uh, this could this should come to a shock of neither of you. Uh, I'm going Notre Dame and Clemson as both of you are uh, you know, hysteric because I'm pretty sure we all at, at first thought had the same game on our uh, you know checklist here. But the way that they beat them, putting up 47 points over Clemson in overtime, a great win. This was the best feeling as a Notre Dame fan. Now, I've been a Notre Dame fan my whole life, and I've gone years of just coming this close getting no respect from, you know, America and not putting Notre Dame in the Alabama Clemson conversation, even though they're ranked so high. And that year we went 12 and 0. I mean, we still lost. We, I mean, we lost in the national championship game. That was really a tough pill to swallow against Alabama, but uh, beating the best ACC team when Notre Dame isn't even technically in the ACC is just crazy. Cause Brian Kelly could take this title this year, take his money and run. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, yes, Yui Ungalale had 439 <laughs> yards, but the story of this game, and we kind of um, touched upon this on my podcast, is that we held ETN to 28 yards. That was huge. They were able to stuff the run. The defense also held Clemson to four for 15 on third down. And – that was really key. We got them off the field, and we outrushed them 208 to 34. We were able to find the hole wherever it was. Notre Dame has, you know, arguably the best O line in the nation, or top two, in my opinion. Uh, Kyron Williams had three touchdowns in this game. I mean, if a sophomore running back has 13 touchdowns and over a thousand yards already, that tells you something. Uh, I know we compared Kyron Williams to guys like Dalvin Cook. And guys like that, but not only that, but we also won the turnover battle in that game. Jeremiah Owusu Karamano was all over the place. Drew White is an outstanding linebacker, not to mention Notre Dame is the 13th best scoring defense 
in college football. And Brian and Andy, so the storming the field after the game was such a special moment because we may never get this opportunity again, thinking about it. If Notre Dame goes back to independent next year, which is what it's looking like as of right now, they're not going to play again for quite some time. I know they do play a lot of ACC schools on their schedule, but what's real special about this year, we're not going to meet one. We're going to meet two times, potentially a third in the college football playoff, right? If the committee puts a two-loss Clemson team in, that's up to them. Uh, That's just insane about possibly meeting for a third time, and this game was just so much fun to watch. Had a nice little celebration after it, and I mean, I know I'm rambling, but this is my game of the year because it was just a special moment that you may never get back. If 2020 has been good to any college football team, it's been to Notre Dame. And by the way, one last thing I forgot to mention, Ian Book. Oh, my God. He, he's so smart with the football. He's proving that he could be a potential mid to late round pick in this year's NFL draft. Great. That, uh, definitely one of the better games that I think, you know, had we all gone at the same game or allowed that here, trying to get it mixed up a little, I think that probably would have been across the board of the game. Uh, but we didn't. We're all going with different games here. Uh, so, Andy, what do you have for your game of the year, a.k.a. your COVID classic? Right. My COVID classic, I, <laughs> if I can follow Tom's incredible uh, game review there. So I'm going BYU Coastal like I kind of teased a couple minutes ago. I, I just think in this weird year, you have to. I mean, you got to shout out these two teams. They put this game together in a, like a week, maybe less than a week after Liberty Uh, was unable to play Coastal Carolina. Uh, First time in the college football playoff era, the two undefeated G5 teams have played this late in the season, obviously both 9-0 coming into the game. Coastal does pull it out 22-17, and it really, it was a weird football game. Uh, So you you got Coastal just pounding the rock with their option offense, you know, 54 total rush attempts as a team for 281 yards, averaging 5.2 yards per carry pretty much getting whatever they wanted on the ground. You mentioned C.J. Marable, Tom, 23 carries for 132 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, Grayson McCall really didn't have to do much through the air, guys. 10 for 15, super efficient there, 85 yards. That's not a lot of uh, passing yards in a college football game. 12 carries for 68 yards as well, so he's contributing uh, with his legs, which is awesome. Uh, You have to mention the last-second stop they had on pretty much the half-yard line. Uh, I think the story of this game really, though, was the turnovers that the Chants were able to pull off. You know, I think they forced a fumble. They also picked off Zach Wilson one time. Uh, Tom, it was interesting that you said this was probably Wilson's worst game, and it really wasn't that bad besides that interception. I know he wasn't really getting as much as he used to, as, as much as he's used to as far as touchdowns go, only with one. But, I mean, 19 for 30 with 240 yards, a touchdown, and 10 carries for 55 yards. 295 yards of total offense. That's not too bad, but you do mention the interception. They do have the fumble uh, that they gave up. And then Algier, the running back, 13 carries for 106 yards and one touchdown, 8.2 yards per carry there. He was getting at anything he wanted. So it was a fun offensive game, despite the score only being 22 to 17. I know I was on the over, did not hit, of course. Uh, and then also Dax Maline had a, a long, I believe, 41 yard touchdown. He finishes the day. I'm sorry, I have that here with six catches for. For 106 yards and a touchdown so uh, the, it was it was it was a very fun game uh you saw the interception that wilson threw was was at half like at halftime as as the half was expiring on a long hail mary so i guess that didn't do too much didn't hurt him too much but uh the chance run that out of the end zone and there is a big scuffle at halftime so there's a lot of juice in this game on both sidelines you know you could tell they didn't really like each other it was the mormons versus the mullets Guys, it, it was awesome. That is my uh, COVID classic, BYU Coastal. That's my game of the year. Just hope that, uh, I mean, Coastal at 11, they're, they're not going to get in. But you just hope they keep winning and, and put some type of pressure on, on these big guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I really do. Cincinnati's obviously sitting at their, up there uh, high enough to get that, that big bowl game that all the G5 mm-hmm. and lower conferences kind of cherish. Um, but I hope Coastal, no matter what happens, does get – uh, at least a decent opponent here in their bowl game. Uh, let's uh, assuming it doesn't get canceled. Some bowl games are already, you know, going the way of cancellation. Uh, but they've been super fun to watch. Like you said, 
Wilson there only had the one touchdown through just his third interception of the year. Like you said, it's not probably not a true interception. Um, but yeah, as far as his offensive production goes, like it wasn't his worst. You're right. But it's the first time all season that he's thrown less than two touchdowns. Um, that BYU offense has been pretty explosive. So good on Coastal Carolina there. I thought they dominated uh, both sides of the ball uh, in the line play. Uh, the most surprising thing to me, I think, down the line, there's maybe just under two minutes when, when they went for the, the last punt of the game. Uh, the commentators were talking about going for it. They're on fourth down. I think they're still in their own half just because of how dominant that Coastal Carolina offensive line had been. Uh, I think they probably would have converted there, honestly. Uh, but they went at the safe yeah. punt. Um, and we got a, a pretty thrilling ending there with getting, to, like you said, probably to the half-yard line. Uh, maybe he didn't. was incredible stop. He was, I don't want to say could have walked in because there were two guys there, but as soon as he caught the ball, he took about two steps. They they hit him, and then you don't like what they were doing to Zach Wilson, you know, keeping him down. Uh, that also caused a fight, but I like what you said about their offensive line. I think their center is like 5'9", 200. Their tallest guy in the offensive line is maybe 6'3". So that's not like the typical big hog mollies you're used to seeing on these SEC teams, on teams like Wisconsin or, or Iowa, or uh, even in the ACC, Notre Dame has got some big guys in their offensive line. So it's nice to see a group of guys who you, I mean, this is no shade on Coastal Carolina, but a group of guys that are that go there, you know, they're not uh, a big 12, a, a big 10 SEC, ACC recruit. It's nice to see those smaller unheralded guys doing big things and, and moving uh, the other line around. Yeah. They're, they're a very uh, dog fighty team. If you watch their, uh, their post games and the locker room, you can tell they're just <laughs> down. They're there to get down and dirty. Um, and then for my game of the year, I probably would have been either of those two games that we've just talked about um, both great right. games, uh, but I'll go with the Indiana Ohio state game uh, for the sole reason that it made us realize that Indiana was a real team behind Penix Jr. Uh, I know we talk about, and Tom absolutely loves them as players and loves their names, uh, Freifogel and Fillier, two of the best names in college football. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting game, I guess more so in the second half than the first half, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. There's just something about Penix Jr. this season – uh, obviously not good enough for any Heisman talk. Or, I mean, he's a good player, but nothing. Uh, he's not going to get in there with how many spectacular players we have this year, uh, regardless, you know, had he not gotten injured. Um, but, yeah, so, so, some big plays from Indiana. Obviously, uh, Fields struggled a little bit in that game, but I think he led some credence to the Big Ten um, looking a little bit more legitimate. I think had they – had Ohio State not – had this not been a close game and Ohio State blew out Indiana, I think all the nonsense going on this week with the Big Ten changing their rules uh, to cater to Ohio, Ohio State's you know maximum 5-0 and going into this game, I think the committee probably doesn't put them in. Because if Indiana loses that game bad, they're maybe, what, ranked in the low 20s, I think. Maybe you know lose a little bit of morale and don't play as well as they did uh, if they get their socks knocked off there. Um, so I think in the long run, this probably helped Ohio State that it was closer than it should have been. And Ohio and Indiana was able to uh, put together a nice season. But it was definitely an interesting game uh, from start to finish. Uh, regardless of what ESPN says about it, they were saying Ohio State was in control <laughs> the entire game with about a 95% chance to win from start to finish. Um, I don't believe that. Don't believe the ESPN uh, hype there. Um, but yeah, three... Three very good games, I think. Uh, good choices by everyone. And speaking of the opposite, games that we did not get to see, we're going to go to our ones that got away, the games that were canceled uh, that we did not get to see. Andy, we'll start with you this one. What game did you want to see that COVID took away from us this year, unfortunately? Um, I mean, well, there's a lot of canceled games. When I'm going through this, I'm trying to think of, like, okay, what's one – that's like has significance or is important because and, and I know this probably wouldn't have been a great game, but to stick on the Ohio State theme, 
uh, the game. Ohio State, Michigan gets canceled this week. Uh, you know, Ohio State enters as 30 point favorites, but I mean, I'm picking this because of the history, also the significance that it would have had on the college football playoff. I mean, obviously, that doesn't matter now because the Big Ten changed its rules, but going into as last week, Ohio State needed this game to get in the Big Ten championship game and help their case to get in the college football playoff. Um, by the way, I mean, I am glad the Big Ten changed their rules because, you know, every other major conference probably besides the Pac-12 would have done this. Uh, so, I mean, go get the cash grab, disperse it across the conference and, and help the Big Ten be better uh, in the future. Keep them in the national conversation. And, I mean, Ohio State's one of the big boys, guys. They're a blue blood. That's what blue buds do. You get preferen preferential treatment sometimes. And I, I'm not trying to say this like, oh, I, I'm – I love Ohio State because I don't. I'm an Illinois fan. They're one of our rivals. I mean, if you, you want somebody in your conference to at least be in that national conversation. Um, but, I mean, going back to this game, I, I just you always love uh, the hate between both sides. I know no fans really would have been there, but still would have been fun on social media and stuff like that. But, I mean, this, this rivalry is almost getting to the point where it's not a rivalry anymore uh, with OSU's dominance. Uh, how much longer can Michigan go on? just getting their asses absolutely handed to them by Ohio state. And then Harbaugh's seat was already hot. Like would this, would a blowout loss here uh, torched it even more? Uh, I know there have been reports that he's been talking with the um, administration in Michigan about a possible extension about his contract. Uh, I think the AD came out and said that they aren't going to be speaking about that till after the year. So I don't know. There's a lot of things up in the air, but this was a, a game that, that everybody always looks forward to uh, in college football, one of the most classic rivalries. Yeah, definitely hard to lose a classic like that. Uh, Tom, what was your cancellation that you wish we could have had here? I really wanted to see BYU play Army in West Point um, because at the time, BYU was ranked 21st, Army was ranked 22nd. Uh, BYU ended up having several players test positive and, you know, the cases just kept spiking there. A lot of social media posts about that. Um, I really wanted to see this game because these were two ranked teams. And if you look at Army's schedule, they led Cincinnati through the first quarter of their game at Cincinnati, if you remember. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. The Black Knights are a real tough football team. I understand it was the beginning of the season, but – Desmond Ritter didn't look too good to start the game. They contained him. You know, he – a lot of people view him as a dual threat type of quarterback. He had negative 14 rushing yards in that game, guys. So Army's defense is fantastic. And, you know, I thought they really had a shot to win that game. So if they could do that to the number eight uh, ranked team, I believe they're eighth right now. They're either seventh or eighth, uh, Cincinnati. But – if they were able to do that on the road, they only lost 24 to 10. And seeing how BYU performed against Coastal Carolina, I mean, I think that speaks volumes to who Army is as a football team this year and the job that um, their head coach has done, Jeff Munkin. I think he's been great. I, w I really wish that we could have seen that game. I'm not saying Army would have won the football game, but I think it would have been fun to watch from a, from a fan's perspective for sure. I mean, I think we really, really missed out on that one. Yeah, that, that was definitely also a hard one uh, to miss there. It's always weird with Army, uh, you know, playing that, that weird style of football. Like you said, Cincinnati yeah. number eight, Desmond Ritter doing, I mean, well in pretty much every other game all season, but they just completely stifled. Uh, he didn't. He didn't look great out there, and when you when you can hold someone of his quality uh, to such minimal production, you know you got a good team on your hands. Uh, so yeah, that's a shame that we had to miss that one as well. For mine, going a bit off the cuff here, uh, it's not really a game that was even on the schedule officially, um, but after the Nebraska-Wisconsin game was canceled, obviously Nebraska when the rules were set at six games for the Big Ten to get into the uh, Big Ten championship, uh, was, or Nebraska decided wanted to schedule a little game against Tennessee Chattanooga. Uh, out of conference, obviously, um, but the Big Ten nixed it, and I think that's kind of a shame. What I find interesting here is, Andy, as an Illinois fan, um, mm -hmm. it seems to me the split here 
regarding the Big Ten changing the rules is that Big Ten fans are all for it, regardless of, you know, they might be an Ohio State rival or just hate Ohio State um, altogether. Uh, and then people that are kind of out of the conference, um, I guess, kind of didn't want it to happen or, or at least impartial. Um, what? If you, I, I don't understand that argument. You're just being a dumb, biased fan towards your team. Sorry if you're a Nebraska fan. Thanks for bringing sports back. That's awesome. But you guys fucking suck. So who cares? Like, my line, I beat you by three scores. You're going to win. You're going to win maybe what, one or two games this year? Who are, is Ohio State taking your spot in the playoff? Let's get a team from our conference in the national conversation. That okay, they've only played the five games. Yes, there are other teams with full schedules, but it, it's this year is so uncertain, and you know how biased the playoff is. If you're a Big Ten fan, do you want to see fucking three SEC teams in there? No, like that argument is just so stupid. Grow up, see beyond your shitty team. But there are actually blue bud good teams in here. I'm not just talking to Nebraska specifically. Anybody in the Big Ten that is upset with Ohio State, I get the Indiana argument. Okay, they've played awesome all year, but Ohio State beat you. Sorry. Uh, I mean, come on. But my line, I would we take down Northwestern this weekend? We'll uh, have have something to say about fourth place in the Big Ugh. Ten West, fellas. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> So, something that I'll, I'll I'll pose this question, I guess, to both of you. Um, mm -hmm. The big the Big Ten's, I guess, schedule uh, from the very beginning, regardless of the six five games, whatever, um, was it at the end? They should have they should have allowed teams they should have allowed teams to reschedule games if if that's what you're asking. I completely agree. No, but I do I do agree that their scheduling was off. But for the championship weekend, everyone will be playing their tiered. Uh, I guess across the board mm -hmm. team uh, of equal ranking. I love that idea, actually. I, mm -hmm. I, absolutely. My question here is: uh, Had Ohio State, let, let's say we switch Indiana and Ohio State. Indiana goes into the Big Ten championship to play Northwestern. Personally, I rate Iowa equally, if not slightly better than Northwestern. Northwestern has probably looked a little better, but I think just traditionally Iowa puts together bigger performances and is a better a better program. Well, yeah, Ohio but State, Northwestern Northwestern beat them this year at Iowa. I mean, yes, they did. And in, in Indiana <laughs> also lost to Ohio State. So I, like you said, you know, it's hard to put to argue that Indiana should be in there above them. Um but to me, I would rate a win against Iowa probably equally still than a win against Northwestern. Obviously, they don't get the you know the title of Big Ten champion if they're you know not right. playing Northwestern this weekend. But personally, I mean, if I'm the committee and they still get a, that win over Iowa, I would still put Ohio State in. Um, I don't think the title itself was that important to me because they're still getting that last game in uh, against Iowa, and Iowa is pretty good. So, yeah, Tom? Uh, but just the, the Nebraska, the whole Nebraska Chattanooga game uh, situation to me. I think, at worst, it just made the Big Ten. Um, it's making everyone ask a lot of questions, I guess, towards them, uh, whether or not you agree or disagree with it. Nebraska's, you know, kind of sitting there like, "Hey guys, what the hell?" Um, because it, <laughs> what, like, <laughs> well, you, did you guys see the U of I, the Illinois football account? They tweeted um, th after we beat <laughs> after we beat Nebraska. They they somebody who's ever on social media, their Twitter there from the Illinois football account said, thanks for bringing football back at Nebraska. And somebody made him take it down. It's like, come on, come on. It's all in good fun. It's fucking Twitter. But Tom, I wanted to get your take on this whole thing, uh, this whole Big Ten championship playing against Iowa. Because, I mean, I, I get it, but I also, I don't know. I, I But I think – I like what the Pac-12 is doing. They're letting their teams reschedule games, and they started after the Big Ten. It's like, Kevin Warren, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, see, it's hard for me to really, like, I mean, I know the Big Ten, there's this bias towards Ohio State because they're, they're really trying to get them into the college football playoff. But I believe Northwestern's clinched a spot in the Big Ten championship game, no? Yes. Mm-hmm. So then yep. the second, the, I'm pretty sure they're going to allow Ohio State to play in it. 
Um, yeah, it, they they changed the rule, so it's going to be yeah. Ohio State versus Northwestern in the championship. I think. Game. I mean, if we're talking about, so are, are we arguing here between Iowa and Indiana to play against Northwestern if they kept Ohio State out? No, more more. I, think, I mean, Bron- more. I think I was just asking the question, posing the question. Um, had Ohio State, had they not changed the rules and Ohio State goes on to play Iowa and still wins, right. um, mm-hmm. would you rate that equally over or compared to a Northwestern win um, and put Ohio State still in, into the playoff? I think so. Uh, so. I, I, I do. I mean, Iowa's not a bad football team. I mean, yes, they, they lost to Northwestern, but I mean, you still have to value that. So. And again, it's Ohio State. Like they haven't really given a reason to prove anybody otherwise, besides playing very minimal games this year. And like I was talking to you guys earlier today about the committee wants to see Justin Fields in, in this playoff. I mean, it's going to drive in ratings. A potential Fields against Lawrence matchup at the national championship game. All due respect to Ian Book and Mac Jones, but if that happens, that will be a lot more watched than let's say in Notre Dame, yeah. Alabama, in my opinion. Although that's what I'm pushing for. I want revenge from 2012, just saying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Irish come up in like every discussion that's not related to them. <laughs> but All good. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think we're all in agreement here. Um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll move on to our games of the week here uh, to end the show. Starting off in our noon time slot. We have a little bit of Pac-12 action. Utah taking on Colorado here. Um, not not much, like you said, Pac-12 has started later than anyone, so it's a bit harder to to judge, I guess, the quality of these teams. But notably, uh, the big argument surrounding Colorado right now is the way that the Pac-12 is refusing to change its championship rules because the Colorado-USC game was canceled. The teams will not play each other, but both very likely to go into uh, next week undefeated. And USC would be given that tiebreaker. Um, So who do you guys think takes this game here? Utah at Colorado. Tom, we'll start with you on this one. I'm looking at the line, and Colorado's only favored by two and a half. A 4-0 team at home against a 1-2 Utah team coming in. Regardless of what the Utes record is, you have to throw the records out the window in this game. I look at Sam Neuer, and yes, you know he's, he's a good quarterback. The season's been short, and he has thrown a few picks. But I really look at uh, Jarek Broussard. He's been fantastic. He's rushed for over 100 yards in all four games this year, not to mention he had a 300-yard performance last week. Levante Chenault has really impressed as a freshman in limited action. I love Nate Landman and Carson Wells defensively. And Jake Brantley, when I get to Utah, Jake Brantley's a real interesting story because, yes, he struggled this year. But remember, back in 2018, he was the guy. Guys, he he was the guy for them. He threw 27 touchdowns, over 3,000 yards. And last week, he looked pretty good against Oregon State. He had no turnovers, was not sacked. Um, Their tight end is a threat. He leads the team in receiving. And then I like what I see from Vontae Davis on the back end with two picks. So for me, you know, the Buffaloes are the easy pick here, but there's a lot to be said about Jake Brant, Jake Brantley and what he's able to bring in. Remember, Utah was very close to making that college football playoff last year. They were not far off at all. So, you know, with that being said, I really want to pick Utah in this game, but with due to the limited action, COVID season that we're in i'm gonna go with colorado only because of their rushing attack what i just said you rush for 300 yards I'm, I'm sorry but i mean their offensive line is really good and their running attack is the reason why i'm gonna pick them here yeah and just very quickly i also, also want to point out uh dimitri stanley obviously like i said the running game doing very well but stanley for the buffs uh only 15 receptions but averaging over almost 20 yards per reception, uh, 246 yards. Um, so they got a pretty good offense there um, in Colorado. Like you said, limited action for Utah. They played some of the tougher opponents. I mean, Oregon State, n- not top top tier Pac-12 right. football there, but they've been playing some interesting games. Uh, a lot of big play ball for, there for the Beavers. So it's not an 
it's not an, an awful win, you know. Oregon State is decent enough. Uh, and then those losses to both Washington and USC, a uh, close one against Washington. But I still don't think that's enough to get them over the hump here. Um, yeah, Ben Lee's, he's a good quarterback last year. He's, I mean, this could be wrong, but I'm, I have written down three touchdowns and four interceptions so far through yes. these first three games. Yep. Um, That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I think when you've only played three games and you're not already starting on a hot streak, it's going to be difficult. Um, so I'm going to ride with the Buffs here as well. Uh, Andy, who you got? Yeah, this is uh, going to be an interesting game here. Two teams with pretty similar styles. They both love to pound the rock. If you talk about Utah, Ty Jordan. Freshman running back is, has settled in pretty nicely. Just three games into his career, 44 total carries, 296 yards, a touchdown. He's averaging 6.8 yards per carry as a freshman. I'm sorry, 6.7 yards per carry uh, as a freshman. I apologize, but he's going to demand the ball going forward. That's that they definitely have their running back of the future. You talked about uh, what he was able to do last week. Uh, I be- I actually have it right here. So career high, 167 yards on 27 carries against Oregon State, getting them their first victory of 30 to 24 last week. First freshman running back for the Utah Utes to run over 100 yards in a single game since 1995. So that's a pretty big deal. They've found a guy that hopefully can take some pressure off of Bentley in the passing game so he's able to get it out to his weapons on the outside which he really hasn't been able to do for this like beginning of the year through these first three games their top receiver Brant Cuthy has 16 receptions for 122 yards uh they have guys like Brian Thompson and Britton Covey is uh healthy for the first time since 2018 Covey uh the redshirt junior had a 64 yard punt return touchdown against Oregon State last week so he has guys on the outside that are explosive that he can get the ball to or that he should be trying to get the ball to. You you look at his stats, 50 for 78, uh, Jake Bentley, the quarterback, I should be mentioning that, 489 yards, three touchdowns, four interceptions. Doesn't jump out at you there. Uh, This (laughs) You just hope that Ty Jordan in the run game can kind of take some pressure off of him and move forward. If that, that happens, I, I think the Utah Utes can keep this close. But if you're looking at Buffalo, you know, uh, the Buffaloes, uh, they are, you know, ranked 21st in the nation, 4-0. Converted safety, Sam Noyer, starting a quarterback. I know he was a quarterback when he originally came to uh, Colorado, played safety a little bit in special teams last year just to get on the field, won the job back this year. Hasn't been too bad, you know, 742 yards, four touchdowns. The four picks aren't great. But, I mean, you mentioned it. Jarek Broussard, 115 carries for 733 yards and three touchdowns. That 300-yard performance last week. So this is going to be, uh, I feel like, a time of possession battle here is who can route, who can run the ball, who can pound the rock better, and maybe throw some play action in there, try to open up some stuff on the outside for both of these teams, maybe get Stanley going a little bit for the Buffaloes. But I like Colorado here. Um, I believe Utah's won like the last two or three of these matchups. So look for the Buffs uh, to try to get some revenge here. Yeah, and just something quickly uh, notable about that Ty Jordan um, stat line as a freshman. Uh, more impressive, actually, when you note that Zach Moss, who is probably one of the better running backs to come out of Utah, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you if, if you got records over that guy, you're doing pretty well. So um, uh-huh. good look for him. And moving into our chaser in the noon time slot, we have a little bit of action. Western Michigan, the Broncos taking on Ball State. Um, Yeah, the the MAC has been hard to follow because we shoot the show so late in the week because the games are getting canceled. Uh, But we got some Saturday action here, and there's a little bit of title implications for the MAC on the line here. Both teams sitting at 4-1 in the conference. So winner will go to take on Buffalo, who, again... We've talked about the last few weeks. Very fun team there to watch. Um, who do you have in this one, Tom? So Western Michigan's coming off a tough loss last week to Eastern. Uh, Caleb bellaby has been really good as a sophomore. I like him. Ladarius Jefferson, Dwayne Eskridge through the air has uh, seven touchdown receptions. And I like Jalen Hall, too. Both their wide receivers, guys, average over 25 yards per catch. So when they get the football... 
They're getting a lot of yards after the catch. I like Ralph Holly a lot in the trenches. They have a good pair of safeties in Bryson Garner and A.J. Thomas. Now Ball State, they're a team that's been on a roll as of late. They've won their last four after losing the opener to Miami, Ohio. But uh, Mike New has not finished over 500 as a head coach at Ball State. Uh, I just don't see – I mean, all due respect to Justin Hall, Johannes Taylor – I have Western Michigan winning on the road. I don't think Ball State's going to be able to withstand uh, Caleb Ellaby. I, mean, I really like what I see from him. I really do. I just talked about Eskridge and Hall combined. They have 13 touchdowns. They have a good pair of safeties. They're the more experienced team, in my opinion. They're both senior safeties, by the way, too. I mean, all these guys are bringing up on defense. They're upperclassmen. So for that reason, and Mike New's bad track record at Ball State, I'm taking Western Michigan in this one, but not comfortably, not too comfortably. Yeah, LB definitely uh, doing very well, improved uh, from his limited action last season, but that 16 to 1 touchdown interception ratio is looking very good. He's thrown more than three touchdowns in all, but just one of the games so far here. Um, it, it might be a little, I don't know if I want to say closer, but a little more of a wild card game. Um, then some might think that both teams over 475 yards of offense each, but both defenses also giving up more than 400 yards here. So we could see a shootout, uh, but like you said, Ellaby has just been spectacular so far in his, his limited amount of games this season. So if you're getting into a shootout, um, I think I'd take him over Plitt. So I'm also going to ride with Western Michigan here on the road. Uh, Andy, who do you have for this one? Um, I am going to take chirp, chirp, boys. <laughs> Give me the Cardinals. I got five of my very best friends are all Ball State graduates. Nick Beatty, Grant Baker, Tyler Yoder, Greg Huss, and Kyle Boyd. I can't pick against my Cardinals, man. Let's talk about what Plitt uh, has been able to do this year. He has thrown a pick in every game, but he still has one, one less yard than LB, <laughs> 10 touchdowns and five interceptions. That's still a two to one. TD to interception ratio, I'll take that out of the Mac. You mentioned how New hasn't been able to, you know, pick up quality wins, hasn't been able to sustain it. I, I mean, look at that win on the road over Toledo they were able to get earlier in the year. That was big, potentially season-changing for this team, giving them momentum. You know, they have Plitt, uh, Huntley carrying the ball, 80 carries, 437 yards, and eight touchdowns. He, if he's able to get loose, he can be a problem for him. Got to give a shout-out to Jordan Williams, Champaign, Illinois native, uh, that is currently on the D-line for the Cardinals. Uh, give me the Cardinals, man. I, we love the underdog role here. Both teams enter at 4-1. and one. If they can limit uh, the offensive attack through the air from the Broncos, I like Ball State in this game but I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be a shootout. All right. Moving into our 3.30. We have a little bit of ACC action as our shot. UNC wants the number five team in the nation taking on Miami. Both teams ranked fairly highly. Uh, Miami, due to the way that the ACC has scheduled their championship this season, getting a little bit uh, of a slight here. Um, can't make the ACC championship game, um, but they can get uh, a little bit of a nice win under their belts against the North Carolina team that's been firing on all cylinders this year uh, behind Howell and that, that great rush uh, attack of the Tar Heels. Andy, who do you like in this one? Uh, we're starting the year, Andy. Uh, if you want to start, you can go on this one, Tom. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you cut out there. I couldn't couldn't hear you. Oh, no, it's okay. We'll yeah, I, I had a little similar issue there. But anyway, um. I'm going to go with the Hurricanes uh, straight up. I think they cover. Look, I love Sam Howell, but remember, he's been sacked 28 times this year. That offensive line is not great, in my opinion. Uh, yes, he does have the third most passing yards in college football. And, yes, they did give Notre Dame a little scare in that game. But I think Miami, De'Ara King, they're going to be ready for senior day. They're going to go out on a high note because they're not making the ACC championship game. So, I think they're going to have a good game. He's been very impressive this year, not to mention Cameron Harris has been solid on the ground for them. I like Jalen Phillips a lot. Offensively, safety Bubba Bolden with four forced fumbles, and they're coming off a 48 nothing win against Duke. <laughs> and since Daniel Jones left, Duke has not been the same football team. Uh, 
But let's keep this in the back of our heads, guys. I would not be shocked if UNC pulls off some magic this week, not only because they have Sam Howell, but their running back, Javante Williams, has 16 touchdowns on the season. Him and Michael Carter are a really good combo. They're veterans in that backfield. I believe Javante is a junior. Michael Carter is a senior. So UNC has two of the top 12 rushers in college football right now, yardage-wise. However, I really like what I see. This Miami defense, Bubba Bold and Jalen Phillips. Let's keep in mind, they barely squeaked by Virginia Tech. So I would not be shocked if there's an upset. I would have this game on upset watch, but I think the Hurricanes are going to squeak by. Okay. Andy? This is, has shootout written all over it, man. The question for me is, can the Canes stop anybody on defense? I mean, they That's haven't true. had to play a lot of high-end offenses, but... 550 yards to Clemson. They gave up over 500 yards to Louisville and over 400 to NC State. Are those two other offenses supposed to scare you? <laughs> they don't have anything near the weapons that the Tar Heels have. But that being said, the Tar Heels have been disappointing this year. Their defense can't stop anybody either. Uh, but you have to mention how impressive Sam Howell is. I mean, he threw for 550 yards and six touchdowns in the win over Wake Forest. Uh, I mean, the running game is rushed for over 300 yards three times this year. If that gets going, Miami needs to watch out. I mean, Derek King has been playing incredible, though. He's probably not putting up the, the sheer numbers he was when he is at Houston. But, I mean, he's hitting 64% of his passes, 20 touchdowns, four picks. I think this is going to be an awesome game. I think it's going to be a shootout. Um, I don't know. I think the question really for me here is which defense is going to step up? and be able to stop either of these offenses. Like if Howell's able to find Deami Brown, 932 yards, eight scores on the, on the year, if they get loose, like watch out. I do think uh, Derek King needs to look to run a little bit more. I think he's uh, been confined more in the pocket and trying to throw the ball, which I mean, if you're hitting 64% of your passes and throwing 20 touchdowns and four picks by all means, keep doing that but everybody knows how electric he is with his legs so i'd like to see him get loose a little bit more i love the over in this game no matter what it is um i'm gonna go with the tar heels i think they pull off an upset here all right over under is 68 so <laughs> hammer it you like that <laughs> split again but yeah uh like you said i i agree with the sentiment that this will probably turn into a shootout um I think the one thing, the one notable thing about North Carolina's offense is that they really get going behind that run, uh, and uh, that allows or has allowed Sam Howell to get those deep balls. Um, and that's that deep ball threat completely disappeared in the Notre Dame game because mm -hmm. they couldn't get that run game going. Um, like you said, the Miami defense not anything you know t t to talk home about, but only allowing a hundred and what is this thirty nine ish yards. Um, the Fighting Irish allow under 100, um, so that'll allow you to do things like they did and keep that run game under control. 140, uh, man, Carter and Williams are just so good. I, I think they'll probably break through that 140, but I'm really not sure who to take here. Um, I definitely yeah. agree the over is the pick here if you're betting <laughs> anything in this game. Um, right. But yeah, I, I, as a, an AAC uh, fan... Uh, I'm going to stand Derek King here uh, from the transfer, like you said, from Houston. Uh, so I'll, I'll go with the Canes here uh, in a close one and a high-scoring one, though. Uh, I won't be surprised into... if Miami wins at all, but I've been like on North Carolina this year, and this one of these times it's got to fucking work. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> if, if you try enough, it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then moving right. into our, our chaser for 330, Army versus Navy. Uh, one of the most historical matchups in all of college football. It is happening this year, maybe not with the usual pageantry that we usually get in an Army-Navy game, um, but the game is happening nonetheless. Andy, who do you like in this game? Uh, on my podcast picks this week, I said it's un-American not to bet on this game. Hammering Army, give me the Black Knights, minus seven. They enter the game at seven and two on the season. Uh, Navy's having a real down year at three and six. Interesting tidbit, though, about this game. For the first time since 1943, this game will not be played on a neutral field. Uh, it will be at West Point, uh, which is awesome. And I believe it's only like the second time ever that's happening. Um, so I don't know. I think 
go army beat navy I, I don't really know a lot about this game i do i do know that army is ranked they like to run that option they have similar um <coughs> offenses here so if you like running and maybe four combined pass attempts all game then this is this is the game for you but i don't know i think army breaks through here um don't have too much of analysis on this just uh, i like army <laughs> Yeah, I'm Navy, going with... Navy's defense is allowing 410 yards per game, though. So we'll go with that. Yeah, I'm going with Army as well here. Um, they had the the tougher schedule. Tom noted uh, earlier that they did not get to play that game against BYU, which would have been nice to, you know, get get a bit of a better read, I guess, on on them as a team. Uh, Navy did play BYU. It did not go very well, 55 to three there. Um, but I think overall, Navy has had a tougher schedule. They've got the three wins, but they've lost to Tulsa, Memphis, BYU, and SMU, who are all very good teams uh, in the AAC, or at least top half, if you rate the ACC, AAC highly. Um, yeah, I, I think Army probably takes it here. Uh, historically, I think they've been the better of the two over the past decade or so. Um, yeah, and again, 410 yards of offense allowed. Notably, they allow more rush yards than pass yards. Uh, which is not what you want when you're going up against a team that plays that similar style of offense where the ball is going to be on the ground most of the game. So Army's probably going to control the clock here. Um, probably low scoring, a little bit of a slog. Um, but it's always an, an interesting, fun game to watch. Uh, so it, it should be should be a good game to have on. Tom, you riding with Army as well, or are you midshipman here? So... I'm a fan of both teams, but I like Navy more. Uh, I'm not saying I'm picking Navy, but like I'm, I, I prefer Navy over Army, uh, and I always have. Navy leads the all-time series, 61-52 to seven, and Army has seven players with over 200 rushing yards this season. So, uh, piggybacking off your point, we'll be seeing a lot of running plays in this game. There will be not many passes at all. Uh, Jacob Buchanan, leading rusher, five touchdowns. Sandon McCoy, 10 rushing touchdowns on the season. He's a senior. He's been great. Look out for Nelson Smith for Navy, their fullback. He has eight touchdowns on the year. He's been real fun to watch. And they have a good uh, defensive player in Kevin Brennan, who I think has been really fun to watch in the games that they've played this year. I'm going to be rooting for Navy, but Army's going to win, guys. We talked about Jeff Munkin before what he's been able to do with this program. But Navy used to dominate Army, like, back when I was a kid, like, back, back when we were younger. But now the ties have turned a little bit. I have Army, but I don't know if they cover. I will I, – I would advise not to pick the spread in this game, but if you want to pick the spread, Andy, go ahead. <laughs> Too late, put it on. But <laughs> I'm concerned about Army covering in this game. I, I, I am picking them to win, but we'll, we will see. All right. Yeah, I'm just not sold. I'm not sold. If, I mean, you, uh, I'm gonna backtrack this here. So you, <laughs> you thought Army would have would have beat BYU. BYU beat Navy 55 to three. Tom, come on, spinning at spin zone here. I didn't pick Army to beat <laughs> BYU, but they they would have made it a game. It All right. right. Okay. There's there's. I don't know. I think got to take it. Fair. That's fair. Fair enough. I don't know. <laughs> fair enough. They they always play close. More yeah, likely. no, it's gonna be it's it's like it's it's they they call it college football's greatest rivalry for a reason, man. It, it I I expect it to be a close game, but if I'm just looking at it from somebody that doesn't know a lot about either team, knowing that I have watched a couple Navy games, maybe one or two this year, not a lot of Army games. I know that they haven't looked good, at least when I've been watching. <laughs> Obviously, there's there's gonna be some extra juice. Uh, for both squads here, but I think Army, this game also being at West Point, I know there's not really going to be fans or anything in the stands, but I think that has some significance to that team as well. I'm sure Monken has made that a narrative this year, being like, hey, you guys are the first team since 1942 to host Navy at West Point. You got to defend the the home field here. We get Where's your pride? This is history right here. Who knows if next year will be the same thing, if it will move – um to navy or, or back to neutral field but i think that also has something to be said about it as well yeah that, that's a very interesting point and i think that would actually be nice to give them to give navy the game back and then go back to neutral uh yeah i like that idea that, that, i think that would be fun to watch 
Uh, and then moving into our late games, our evening games, 7.30, our shot, we have USC taking on UCLA. USC, probably the best team in the Pac-12 right now, sitting at 4-0. Taking on the Bruins and that Chip Kelly offense, which wasn't too great last year, but doing okay this year. Um, only three-point loss. <laughs> they took Oregon uh, to the end there. Um, the other loss to Colorado, who's probably uh, also sitting up there, is the second best team in the Pac-12. So a decent team this year. Um, Slovis doing his thing with the Trojans. Tom, who do you have in this game? So USC's favored by three. Uh, I'm going with them. They've scored at least 28 points in every game this year. Uh, Slovis completing 72% of his passes, 10 touchdowns. Three running backs on this team have two rushing touchdowns through four games. Pretty darn impressive. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown has been really good. Four scores on the season, and Drake London as well. Uh, only 20 catches, but for 330 yards. I mean, I think that says a lot. And I like this USC defense. Talanoa Hofanga with the three interceptions through four weeks. That's very impressive as well. And I like Nick Figueroa a lot. He's really good with his hands. So you're going to see, you know, possibly some stunt moves on that defensive line. We'll see what Clay Helton and his guys have drawn up. But I have USC winning this game. UCLA does not impress me a whole lot. Uh, Dimitri Felton is okay. I mean, he's averaging five yards a clip. Don't get me wrong. But as you guys mentioned, the Pac-12 competition isn't all that great. Um, so, yeah, I think, and in my opinion, UCLA's leading target is Greg Dulcich. They're tight end. I think he's their most scary weapon that you have to keep an eye on if you're USC defensively matchup-wise. So, uh, with that being said, give me USC. Okay. Yeah, to USC there with the uh, the balanced rushing attack as well. They got three guys um, sitting around the same amount of carries, all with two touchdowns through these first four games. So, um, they seem to at least have their game plan sorted out. Um, despite the fact that the Pac-12 has been a little bit of a wild ride um, as far as scheduling and games go. Um, Slovis, I, I think, is by far the better quarterback in this matchup, uh, having a pretty good season so far. Um, does have the two interceptions, but 153 um, passer rating. I I don't know. I, I love Chip Kelly as a person. I really want UCLA to be like a fun and exciting team to watch that gets really good. I don't think this is that year. Um, yeah, I, I probably take USC straight up here and with the points. Um, mm -hmm. Just be, I don't know. You see, I'm not sold on UCLA <laughs> here. Uh, and like you said, the, the Trojans defense has been pretty good, and that over 28 points per game is looking very nice for the Trojans. Uh, Andy, are you also riding with the Trojans here? Or do you like the Bruins? So I like the Trojans. They're another one of my podcast picks. I actually got USC minus two and a half last night. I love that. Um, but it, I think it's going to be closer than you guys think. If we look at the numbers here, obviously USC is 4-0, 15th in the country. They need this game for a spot in the Pac-12 championship game. So there's that aspect of it. But points per game for this season, uh, USC 33.3. UCLA 32.6. Uh, USC is allowing 21.8. UCLA is allowing 24.8. Uh, USC is averaging 42 and a half or 42 and a half, 40, 424 and a half yards per game. Most of that through the air. There are two different offensive identities here. UC, uh, USC likes to sling it around with 313 pass yards per game only 111 on the ground. While UCLA is a lot more balanced team, we know what Chip Kelly's offense likes to do. They're averaging 227 yards on the ground a game and only 203 uh, through the air, a total of 430.6 uh, per game uh, yardage-wise. So, I mean, their offense is technically six yards better <laughs> than USC per game. I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, this is one of those rivalries I think you can kind of throw, throw out the records uh at some time but I, i'm gonna take the trojans here i think they can win by three um but i don't know i think it's gonna be closer than people think yeah notably here um in common opponents uh like you said ucla outperforming the trojans by a tiny bit uh offensively but also uh the asu game trojans win that game by one uh ucla beats them by a touch uh and then 
also both played Arizona. Trojans took that by four, while UCLA wins by 17. So, um, yeah, like I said, the, the Chip Kelly offense is always interesting. Um, always mm-hmm. got something up his sleeve, so we'll see here. Um, and then I just want to touch on, we I kind of talked about earlier, the whole USC-Colorado um, debacle yeah. that's going on. Neither will play each other <laughs> because that game was canceled earlier in the season, but both undefeated here. USC gets the tiebreaker because they played a game more. Who do you got? I mean, do we think this is fair here? Or, I mean, what what do you do, I guess, in this scenario? Um, the tiebreakers are written into the rules, but like we've seen this past seven days with the Big Ten, we can throw the rules out the window if we want because it's COVID season. Uh, anything is up uh, <clears throat> for debate here. Um, what should the Pac-12 do? Um, or should they do nothing? What can you do? Like, what, Can they get another game for Colorado? Well, I guess they're both 4-0 right now, so... Yeah. Th- Does USC both- still have one more game on the schedule after this, but Colorado's done? I don't believe so. I think the issue is that Colorado missed a conference game, <laughs> so they're, they're behind in the conference record tiebreaker. Oh, okay. Then, yeah, I mean, if USC's got a better conference record, it's kind of just like, sorry, it sucks and this year that that's what it has to be this year. You'd like to think that maybe the Pac-12 could get them – uh, a game scheduled before the conference championship, maybe who who would be coming out of the other side? Um, sitting right Washington. now, Washington is at three and one, and Oregon at three and two. So, I mean, the the big argument um, people have been trying to make is that because Oregon has, I mean, wildly underperformed, they've had two very bad mm-hmm. losses. Uh, Washington, a decent team, but probably not uh, the caliber of a Pac-12 champion they want to just throw everything out the window and have Colorado play USC in the championship game. So, Well, also, I think what's important to note here is that Washington and Oregon were supposed to play this weekend and had their game canceled. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's being paid up, but I think that carries weight. So I think right now you're looking at a USC-Washington Pac-12 title game, sadly. So... I think for Colorado and Oregon, I mean, I think you could pretty much eliminate Oregon from the, the discussion at this point. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, um, but that's actually really interesting that you uh, noted. Yeah, that's just where I'm at with that. It's interesting that you noted that they would have played Washington this week. I wasn't aware of that. Had Colorado played them and won that game, I think that really strengthens the argument to just throw Washington completely out of the, the Pac 12 championship game and just have. USC play Colorado, but uh, unfortunately we're not going to get to see that. Right. Uh, leave it there because, I mean, the Pac-12, I, I don't think any team has a chance. USC is pr- going to have to win by 100 this game and, you know, the next game just probably to get into the sixth spot. So, uh, All right. Well, how we talked about Miami earlier. Mm-hmm. There is potential that USC finishes undefeated and Miami finishes with, with one loss and nobody's going to give a shit. Like those are two like classic, like blue blood programs from, you know, the early two thousands at this point, but still that's pretty interesting that two pro- historically great programs like that could potentially, potentially finish with one combined loss and they will be nowhere near the playoff. Yeah. It's, I mean, definitely unfortunate for them. Uh, I, I think they both had pretty good seasons, so. Uh, but nothing Absolutely. we can really do about it. Moving into the chaser for 7:30. If you don't like that Pac-12 action, um, we have Virginia taking on Virginia Tech. The Hokies <laughs> sitting at four and six. Cavaliers five and four. Uh, an interesting matchup here, uh, but Virginia Tech on a four-game losing streak. So who do, who do you think pulls this one off, Tom? So lately, Virginia's been trending in the right direction, guys. After a rough start, Virginia Tech, it's been quite the opposite. Uh, They're on two polar ends of the spectrum right now. But I I like what I see from Brennan Armstrong as of late. He's been solid, and he's also the team's leading rusher with five 
rushing touchdowns and over 500 yards. Billy Kemp and Lavelle Davis are guys to keep an eye on. Tony Paulson as well. The tight end has five scores. So it's by, by the way, Charles Snowden. Oh my God, have you seen how big this guy is? He's six seven. He, he leads their team with six sacks. So that's an you know that's an astonishing fact for me. Hendon Hooker. I mean, I don't know how impressive he is to me. To be honest with you, I mean, he's he's an okay starting quarterback at this level. The guy that I, I really hone in on in this game, if I'm Virginia, and I think this is Virginia Tech's only chance to win, is if Khalil Herbert mm-hmm. runs all over them. He's going to have to run all over them. There's over a thousand yards, seven scores. He's, in fact, he's the fifth leading rusher in college football. So, I think for Virginia, you're going to have to contain him and find a way. So. This is the one game I've had trouble picking, guys, even up to this very moment. I still don't know 100% who I'm going with, but, you know, I'm going to put myself on the spot here and say Virginia is going to win this game. I really – I was very on board with picking Virginia Tech if we pushed this back to a few weeks ago. But it's kind of like the way teams are trending lately. I mean, I got to go with the Cavs. That's the only option here for me. Yeah, it's been a bit of a tale of two halves of the season for the Hokies. Just I'm, they've played. I'm, let's let's give them a little bit of credit. Clemson, Miami, and Liberty, who are all you know ranked in very good teams. Uh, Clemson, Miami, a little bit higher than Liberty, but still, I'll give Liberty some credit. Um, so they're not terrible losses, but when you just get on a skid like that, it's never very good near the end of the season. You get players that kind of give up. I mean, we've seen it in terms of opting out once these teams go on the skid this year players are like all right uh, you know i'm done with the season um and instead of just not even playing you know we got people transferring as well so just completely opting out um yeah i don't know who to take straight up in this game another situation where both defenses just look absolutely abysmal Um, both around 450 yards of offense given up so i mean we'll see like you said herbert um, could be the key for the Hokies here. Uh, but Virginia only giving up around 125 yards on the ground per game. I will say Virginia, th- I mean, this line could have moved, but Virginia here is the dog at plus three. That's what I have written down. Maybe that's changed. But I think if you like this game to be close, you take Virginia plus three because they are, mm-hmm. like I said, trending upwards, Tom. Virginia Tech trending in the wrong direction. So um, I think just, you know, if I'm taking the plus three, let's just ride with the Cavs all the way here. Uh, Andy, who do you think takes this one? I'm going to go with the Cavaliers as well. Uh, So last year, Virginia is able to snap that 15 year losing streak against Virginia tech. So they're looking to start a streak of their own, uh, which I look for them to do. I mean, you mentioned Brennan Armstrong. He's leading the team in passing yards and rushing yards, you know, 111 carries, 529 yards, five, five scores with his feet. He's completing 65% of his passes, nine touchdowns to only, I'm sorry, 16 touchdowns and nine interceptions is, is what I meant to say. And then you talk about Billy Kemp on the outside. He's averaging almost seven receptions per game. Uh, and then they have Terrell Jana and tight end Tony uh, Poljohn as well, each with 33 grabs. So he has weapons on the outside on Virginia tech side of the ball. You hit it right on, uh, you hit the nail right on the head Tom, when you said Khalil Herbert, if this offensive line for Virginia Tech can give him some space, watch out. He will be able to rack up some yards. I mean, he had 21 rushes against Clemson last uh, last week. I know they've lost 45 to 10, but that's definitely something to build on. That's got to give him more confidence if your offense is handing you the ball 21 times. So I think Virginia takes a close game here. It's hard not to take. Uh, the team that's on a four game winning streak uh, as opposed to the team that's on a four game losing streak. Uh, You never know uh, if Trey Turner can get the ball as well, or if hooker can get Trey Turner, the ball as well for Virginia tech, that could be interesting, you know, 504 yards, three touchdowns on 31 receptions this season, but in a close one, I'm going to take Virginia. All right. Virginia across the board there which is interesting because that game is slated to be so close. But that will wrap up our games of the week. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks to Andy and Tom for joining me again this week. 
Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe down below. Links to all our social media also in the bottom. Links to Andy and Tom's. Oh, yeah, there we go. Andy on my left, Tom on my right. Uh, their social media links also in the description. Uh, enjoy the last week of the regular season, and we will see you guys all next week.